Today, we're exploring the cultural aspects of the David and Goliath struggle between Ukraine, a young democracy versus Russia, an old imperial autocracy. Russian propaganda tries to play up the similarities between Ukrainian and Russian culture because of some of the shared history and cultural ties. However, there are significant differences between the two literary traditions due to the historical and cultural context in which the two literary traditions developed. Ukrainian literature has a strong tradition of folk tales and oral poetry, and it's been influenced by the country's complex political and cultural history too, including periods of colonization and national struggle. Russian literature, on the other hand, has been shaped by its own distinct history, including periods of imperial expansion and revolutionary upheaval. Ukrainian writers were persecuted in the 1920s during the period of Soviet rule in Ukraine as part of a process to suppress Ukrainian national identity and culture and replace it with a new Soviet identity. Literature was a key tool for this, as it is also for Russia today. Olga Palyukovich is a writer, literary critic and editor. She is an associate professor at the National University of Kiev Mikhail Academy and managing editor at the Kiev Mikhail Humanities Journal. Olga is an alumnus of the Fulbright Programme and research fellow at IWM Vienna. And finally, she'll participate in an NGO together with Maria Shuvalova, we will put links, of course, in the video description to the organization she is associated with, as well as to some of her recent articles and materials. And of course, if you like the materials we produce and the amazing guests that we've got on, then do please like and subscribe. And if you want to get involved further, do please consider becoming a patron. Olga, welcome to the channel. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan, for your introduction. Well. We're going to talk a lot about literature, culture, and of course, imperialism. But if you can start a bit by talking about your work, you know, and your research, and what you really focus your expertise on. Uh, I've been teaching uh, Ukrainian literature uh, at the university for several uh, years. And uh, uh, my focus is uh, on uh, identity. Uh, memory studies uh, and uh, resistance of the 20th uh, century uh, Ukrainian literature. Uh, also, I'm interested in uh, contemporary uh, Ukrainian literature uh, and not only Ukrainian, but uh, in, Ukra in Ukrainian topics uh, within other uh, national literatures. Uh, which is very interesting to me because, uh, you know, Ukrainian diaspora is one uh, of the largest uh, in the world. And uh, it's uh, amazing that uh, we can uh, hear and see uh, Ukrainian topics, Ukrainian uh, voices uh, uh, in uh, different uh, traditions, uh, not only uh, in a Ukrainian one. Uh, also, uh, now uh, when uh, this, this, the full scale of war began, uh, I've been writing about uh, war, primarily about culture, uh, Ukrainian literature, history. Uh, but before that, uh, I was uh, writing uh, a book about uh, Ukrainian emigre writer uh, Yuri Kosic, who was a nephew of uh, famous uh, Ukrainian classic writer uh, Lesa Ukrainka, uh, who is uh, together with Taras Shevchenko and uh, Ivan Franko are considered uh, um those who are the best, uh, who are in the center of uh, the canon of ukrainian literature and uh, it's uh, this uh, uh, figure uh, he witnessed uh, almost all uh, 20th century and lived uh, in different uh, uh, cities uh, like uh, in Paris, in Berlin, uh, in Warsaw, and uh, uh, almost 40 years uh, he lived uh, in uh, the US, uh, in New York, where he uh, died. So uh, it also uh, explores uh, um, that uh, diasporic uh, element uh, of uh, Ukrainian uh, literature and uh, at the same time all the turbulences of the 20th uh, century my character faced. And how important has the diaspora been to supporting the war? Because, 
you know, before we started, we were talking about there being so many events associated with politics, culture, literature, etc. in the UK specifically now, but I know in the US and across Europe as well. So how important is the diaspora in raising awareness of Ukraine's struggle? It's uh, extremely important and uh, it's even um, very significant to, to us, uh, to Ukrainians, because uh, uh, the last year uh, we could not celebrate uh, Shevchenko days, uh, Shevchenko birthday, which is uh, on March, March uh, 9th. Uh, in Ukraine, yeah. But uh, when I was researching the news, I saw that my colleagues uh, were having the conferences, Shevchenko days, uh, in uh, different cultures, uh, sorry, in different uh, countries. And uh, I was thinking that uh, it's not uh, so easy to uh, cancel <laughs> Shevchenko. And now this year, uh, we uh, finally managed to uh, celebrate Shevchenko days. And this, uh, you know, uh, diasporic a component it gives us a sense of continuity because uh, Shevchenko days and Shevchenko celebrations it's a national feast not only in Ukraine but also in Ukrainian communities uh, abroad and uh, we saw also a huge uh, support uh, of uh, diaspora uh, before the invasions, uh, before the invasion and uh, uh, during uh, it, uh, during the uh, uh, first uh, year uh, of the war. And uh, it uh, also influences um, the events uh, in Ukraine and uh, also influences the international uh, politics as well. And this is a really big theme, isn't it? Shevchenko is a sort of dominant figure in Ukrainian literature. But there is also another highly influential writer who chose a very different path and has become, of course, a national voice of Russian literature, and that is Gogol. But of course, he was Ukrainian as well. And this highlights a very difficult 19th century choice that writers and artists, you know, characters had either they could go the national route and write in Ukrainian and adopt certain themes, national themes, or... Um, they could become part of the imperial project. I mean, perhaps it's a little unfair to class them as imperial writers, but they would have had to choose to write in Russian and, you know, potentially choose a slightly different focus of their themes to achieve their artistic goals and, of course, material success. Uh, yes, uh, the 19th century is uh, a very problematic period uh, in Ukrainian uh, history, and uh, this is also the period of uh, uh, strengthening of uh, uh, emerge of Ukrainian literature, uh, which is uh, represented by two figures, uh, as you mentioned, primarily two figures, uh, Taras Shevchenko and Mykola Gogol, uh, better known as uh, Nikolai Gogol, uh, all over uh, the world. And uh, these uh, two, they uh, remain um, I would say uh, the symbols of uh, the two possible ways uh, an artist uh, who uh, was born in Ukraine, who, who lives in Ukraine, uh, could uh, choose uh, during that uh, time. Uh, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, Howell's choice was not uh, uh, as easy because, uh, like you know, uh, Psychologically, for him, uh, it was very tough uh, to uh, live in the empire and under empire. And uh, it is very uh, good uh, depicted in his uh, novels, where he uh, depicts Russians not in a very, like, you know, positive manner. Uh, otherwise, but uh, I, I love Nabokov's... Uh, um, uh, stance that uh, uh, if you want to know something about Russia, don't trust Go Gogol. Yeah. So how uh, Russian propaganda is trying to uh, to control the reception, the overall reception and speaking about uh, uh, the times of Gogol, uh, he was not perceived as alien. Uh, among Ukrainian community, because uh, Taras Shevchenko, uh, who devoted to Hohol one of his poems, uh, he 
uh, respected uh, this writer, uh, respected his talent and Shevchenko uh, with his uh, historical vision uh, of Ukraine uh, could uh, uh, recognize uh, Gogol uh, as uh, Ukrainian, but other who, ch who chose other uh, paths unlike uh, to him, uh, Shevchenko, who uh, chose to uh, become a voice uh, of the uh, oppressed uh, Ukrainian uh, nation. And, uh, if, and we can see now these uh, two choices that uh, should be uh, understood uh, in a historical perspective. And in fact, you know, I mean, understanding Imperial Russia, I think Gogol, is exactly who you should be reading in order to try and understand it. I mean, you know, walking through St. Petersburg streets, it's his city, it's the city of his imagination, and you interpret that city through his stories. And, of course, they're deeply satirical, aren't they? They're deeply critical of the Russian system of governance. They're the administrative hierarchy that you find in the Russian Empire and the sort of deference to power that is built into that system. And of course, he he did eventually go mad, didn't he? And a lot of his stories are about the sort of madness of that system, as well as its corruption, uh, and, and that kind of imaginary, sort of slightly fevered atmosphere uh, that you can get, uh, even living in St. Petersburg, never mind trying to sort of rise up uh, within the uh, structure of its, say, administration. Yes, uh, exactly. I, I more than uh, agree with you. And uh, it, uh, it's how uh, he viewed uh, and felt uh, the world uh, he's living within. So this uh, uh, empire, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's like uh, very... Uh, it was it was understandable for uh, Ukrainian artists like uh, Shevchenko, uh, who also lived uh, under uh, Russia's imperial rule and uh, who was uh, uh, exiled, who was imprisoned uh, because of his uh, criticism of uh, Russia's imperial rule. And this criticism, it was serious, it was sharp, unlike to Gogol's. Uh, which was, you know, like uh, mild, uh, it was uh, a little bit burlesque, uh, it was uh, funny overall, uh, as if it's, it was not serious. It was serious, but uh, we uh, are having two uh, different uh, manners in uh, depicting uh, of the Russian Empire, but uh, the ground, uh, the essence uh, is uh, the same. And another thing I hadn't realized really before last year, uh, before I started looking into this and, of course, spoke to many Ukrainians, I hadn't realized just, you know, how little time Gogol had actually spent in Russia. He traveled around a lot in Europe and so on. He, of course, spent time growing up in Ukraine and being educated there, um, but spent relatively little time within the uh, Russian Empire itself. But there's the the humor and there's the satire and all this stuff. And I think a lot of people uh, would have known that, uh, you know, he's he's looking at society as an outsider. And I think that gives him a different perspective rather than someone who is is uh, living and breathing the system as a as a natural entity. He's actually, you know, inside it, but but critiquing it Uh as somebody who was brought up in a in a different sphere. Another great artist who I had no idea was Ukrainian, of course, um, is uh, Repin, Ilya Repin. And of course, there's a lot of satire and political and social commentary in his paintings. And in this case, I think Russia has totally appropriated that artist and his style. They've labeled it as, as purely Russian, a manifestation of Russian culture. But once again, I think you realize that he's Ukrainian. You start to see uh, that he is observing Russian society as an outsider from a different perspective. And, you know, probably doing that with a, a critical eye in his own mind. He's imagining a very different political system, a different way of living when he's observing Russia. And I think, you know, you can see, you start to see these signs uh, in his paintings. 
Uh, yes, uh, exactly. Uh, it also should be mentioned uh, that uh, Hohol uh, spent much time in Italy, uh, exactly in Rome. And uh, in his letters, uh, he wrote that Rome uh, resembles him uh, Ukraine, uh, his homeland. And uh, uh, Hohol actually uh, liked uh, uh, this uh, city very much. Uh, and spent uh, much time there than in uh, uh, in Moscow or St. Petersburg. And uh, really, this uh, like author uh, perspective uh, gave him a better, uh, more clear uh, vision of uh, Russian Empire and its system. And uh, Repin is the same. If you look at his uh, pictures, for example, when I am speaking about myself, uh, I can see uh, the Cossacks, uh, the Hetmans, uh, Ukrainian steppes, uh, Ukrainian uh, landscapes, uh, just the things uh, uh, that I can observe in my daily life. Uh, how, why I should regard him as a Russian painter, uh, on which basis, why? And uh, what also comes to my mind, uh, if we are making a leap to the 20th century, uh, there was a, a Ukrainian writer, emigrant writer, uh, Ivan Bagriany, uh, who was sentenced uh, several times uh, by the Soviets, uh, he was imprisoned, but uh, finally he uh, escaped the imprisonment and after the Second World War, uh, he was in the uh, displaced persons camps in Germany and he wrote a novel about uh, Stalin's uh, concentration camps, like Stalin's camps uh, uh, of forced labor, uh, the whole uh, system of the Soviet prisons. And this novel is called uh, Sad Hetsimansky, uh, The Garden of Gethsemane, and this novel uh, was written uh, from uh, having this, uh, you know, uh, first of all, freedom of speech, because it was not possible to write uh, such a novel in Ukraine uh, after World War II. Yeah, and uh, the second, uh, that uh, he uh, realized uh, his experience uh, from uh, the distance, from the outer perspective. And uh, if we are thinking about this novel, it uh, uh, appeared 20 years uh, before the uh, Archipelag Gulag by Solzhenitsyn, uh, who is uh, very well known uh, in the world, uh, describing uh, Stalin's uh, camps and uh, gulags. But uh, Ukrainian perspective, uh, I think also uh, should be added here because uh, Bagrani's novel for a uh, reason known uh, was not translated uh, into many uh, languages, but it depicts uh, Stalin's uh, uh, oppressive system uh, from the Ukrainian perspective and without, you know, any uh, pathos or uh, illusions or a romanticization. Uh, there is no such things uh, like that. So the author uh, perspective is very important. And uh, just uh, coming back uh, to Shevchenko, uh, Shevchenko lived uh, not much time in Ukraine. So uh, he was living, uh, he spent much of uh, his life in uh, prisons, uh, in exiles, in the foreign expeditions. But Ukraine uh, was something that uh, he always had uh, in his mind. And when we are thinking about him as, you know, such a Ukrainian uh, writer, poet, prophet, uh, etc., we have to keep in mind that this person, in fact, um, dreamt all his life to live in Ukraine. But in fact, uh, speaking uh, about facts, uh, he lived not so many years in Ukraine at all. And also he had this, uh, you know, author perspective as well. And of course, it's it's interesting mentioning Solzhenitsyn because we think of him as a sort of dissident writer. We think of him as a great rebel when, in fact, you know, I, I, I do recommend to people that before they check out Solzhenitsyn, who is well known, that they actually read books by Valam Shalam of the Kalima tales, which I think are, are kind of more interesting, uh, both as literature, 
but also as first-hand witness. Um, and, uh, you know, they really convey the sort of suffering of that system. And then perhaps go and, and read Solzhenitsyn so you can compare and contrast. But, you know, when we look at Solzhenitsyn, he later became an incredibly influential uh, political figure uh, to an extent as well. His writings um, actually came to influence Putin himself and Putin's world philosophy to an extent, uh, that sort of... Uh, Russian exceptionalism that is rooted within it. Um, so even though Solzhenitsyn was extremely critical of Stalin, um, I think his philosophy was deeply, to an extent, imperialistic and nationalistic, and in that sense, a very traditional uh, Russian philosophy. And that's a really big challenge, isn't it? Because as well as distinguishing literature that has a more Ukrainian source or has its roots in Ukrainian culture, there's one strand, another strand, which is decolonization. It's a difficult one to point out uh, without being labeled as Russophobic, but much of Russian literature itself uh, is, is sort of deeply imbued with pro-imperial views. One could almost say, you know, the um, precursor of the sort of genocidal uh, attitude that was inflicted on Ukraine in the 30s and what we're seeing now as well, uh, deeply embedded in some of Russian literature. And even Pushkin and others have passages which are extremely, so strongly in terms of the imperial attitudes that they express. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this comment. And uh, uh, here what I can add is that, uh, yeah, for me, um, uh, the most telling fact is that Solzhenitsyn died in Russia uh, by his own death, yeah? And if you look at uh, Ukrainian dissidents uh, of that time, uh, they did not have such uh, an opportunity, an option, or uh, a privilege. Yeah, and uh, it's what uh, differs uh, uh, Ukrainian dissidents uh, from the Russian the Russians, because they are going to the end in their crit criticism of the system, uh, mainly they do not uh, compromise. And Russia is a uh, authoritarian state, as a totalitarian state. Uh, it tries to uh, control uh, even the uh, dissidents. Yeah, and it's uh, their uh, century uh, politics. It's not uh, the news. So and. Uh, if we are speaking about uh, Pushkin, uh, it's also the same. His uh, poetry, it uh, transmits uh, the uh, imperial uh, narratives. For example, if we are looking at uh, how he depicts uh, uh, minor uh, ethnic groups yeah, uh, within the Russian Empire. Uh, he neglects them, uh, he does not uh, value them as uh, normal uh, or uh, like even other, but as uh, uh, something uh, marginal and not worth uh, attention. Uh, yeah, and uh, also uh, I was thinking about uh, other uh, Russian uh, writer who was uh, exiled from uh, the Soviet Union, uh, Joseph Brodsky. Uh, who also had this, you know, uh, um, a long life sentiment to his homeland, to a state which, in fact, did not allow him to live there, uh, who just uh, like uh, did not uh, give him any uh, opportunity. Uh, but uh, he forbade it. Uh, authorities, uh, I, I, when we. Uh, read his uh, poetry everything is fine there and uh, uh, it's it's a great question that we are uh, having now uh, i mean in ukraine uh, which is with uh, why uh, western uh, academia uh, the centers of russian studies uh, which are numerous uh, all over the world uh, why they failed uh, explain through russian literature and culture uh, the uh, origins of this uh, brutal genocidal war. Because if we look at the Ukrainian literature, uh, we can explain our resistance through it. 
uh, it's natural thing. Uh, this uh, resistance uh, did not appear uh, on February 24th. Uh, Ukraine literature uh, was formed as a grand narrative against the myth of uh, Ukraine uh, and Russia people uh, as brotherly, uh, uh, brotherly people, like, you know, as, uh, as a unity, as a totality. Ukrainian literature was sensitive to these borders and uh, it showed the alternative. Uh, it showed uh, the uh, difference uh, between the two. Uh, it's not only the story. Uh, it's not only the story of Shevchenko. Uh, it's the story of uh, uh, other uh, Ukrainian uh, writers, and we can uh, observe the origins of the today's resistance in Ukrainian literature. Uh, but could we also see the origins of uh, genocidal war, brutality, atrocity? Uh, Russia is doing now in Ukraine uh, in Russian literature. Yeah, so uh, these are the questions that uh, should be explored and learned. This is a topic that I've discussed with a lot of my guests, and um, you know, it covers uh, art and politics, also media, academia, but until recently, now almost everything was done through a Moscow lens. If you report, if you're reporting on from a region, um, and often, uh, you know, Western correspondents, you know, you'd get your views from what you're seeing around you. And that could include friends and colleagues and associates in Russia itself who are helping you to interpret events. And even though they they may have liberal views on certain topics, they're still, as we can now see, seeing things through a very sort of uh, uh, Russia or even Muscovite uh, kind of lens. And that colours your interpretation of everything that goes on in the territories of the former USSR. So what needs to change? And, and is it already changing now? And, uh, you know, what what needs to happen so that we, we don't go back to that world uh, where, uh, you know, the West sees the entire region through a Russia, Russo-centric lens? Uh, yes, I was uh, at the beginning uh, of the full-scale uh, Russia's invasion. I was uh, scared uh, to see that uh, uh, respected Western media uh, called the events that are happening in Ukraine, uh, like uh, Ukraine, Ukraine's crisis or a conflict in Ukraine, or Russia-Ukraine conflict, Russia-Ukraine crisis, and so on and so forth. We should clearly understand that such a vision was, uh, there, uh, was influenced uh, by Russian propaganda and Russia's myth of uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia uh, as uh, two brotherly uh, nations or uh, Ukrainians and Russians as two brotherly uh, peoples. And uh, which is why it was not uh, obvious that these are two uh, different uh, peoples. And uh, I think that this is uh, changing now. Uh, the world is much more sensitive uh, to, to these uh, nuances, to the boundaries. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, the price that we are paying for this acknowledgement uh, is very, very high because uh, each day uh, Ukrainian uh, soldiers and civilians uh, are uh, dying because of Russia's uh, uh, invasion. Uh, but uh, the situation, uh, of course, uh, uh, changes. Uh, but uh, mm, uh, I think the problem also is that uh, Ukraine was not uh, perceived uh, seriously. So when uh, Russians said uh, to the world, we will capture Kiev in three uh, days, and uh, the, West, uh, the West gave uh, a couple more days and uh, Kiev should fall. Yeah? Uh, but it did not happen like that. And uh, in Ukraine, we knew that. They won't capture Kyiv in three days, in 30 days, uh, in 30 years, and in 300 years, etc. Because it's not possible. Uh, me, as a witness of uh, Orange Revolution, of Euromaidan events, 
uh, I can tell you this for sure, because uh, I know my people, what they are capable of and how they are, what is their attitude uh, to the oppression, any kind of oppression, uh, attitude towards the violation of their uh, rights. And another uh, problem uh, I would like to mention uh, is that uh, you, uh, that Russia, um, Russia's uh, mighty and powerful identity was based upon the uh, victory of World War Two, yeah, and. Uh, Ukraine uh, knows this from other perspective because Russia had never truce and reconciliation uh, commission and the crimes of the communist era were never recognized on the larger scale. They were never put to uh, court uh, and justice uh, was never established. And uh, if we are thinking about Holodomor, uh, Stalin's made, uh, made a famine of 1932-1933, uh, uh, or uh, Stalin's uh, gulags, uh, or, yeah, uh, or uh, forced psychiatric treatment or imprisonment of the dis dis uh, dissidents uh, or, for example, um, uh, Stalin's great terror when uh, thousands of uh, Ukrainian writers, intelligentsia, uh, were uh, executed and killed just for being uh, Ukrainians, just for writing and speaking in Ukrainian uh, language and uh, Chernobyl disaster, the deportation of Crimean Tatars. Look, uh, in each uh, uh, Ukrainian family, you will find the memory of uh, one, at least one of these uh, events, which was in terms of uh, the separate family, it was a tragedy. Uh, some of my uh, friends, they uh, lost uh, their uh, ancestors uh, during the famine. And it's not an something abstract. It's a real story. Millions were starved to death. And we have many such uh, national tragedies. So uh, Ukraine paid an uh, unbelievably high price for being a part of the Russian world. Uh, that's why when Russia uh, attacked Ukraine, uh, it, it was uh, understandable uh, that uh, we will not uh, surrender uh, because, you know, we remember our history, uh, previous crimes uh, against Ukrainians, and we know what Russians are capable of uh, if we won't stop them. And Zelensky's speech, I think, was a kind of perfect encapsulation of the differences between the Russian attitude and the Ukrainian one when he said that, you know, with with power, with heat, with light, with food, um, you know, and then he added to every one of those criteria uh, that we would choose suffering. We would choose to be without all of these things if it meant being without Russia as well, not having Russia try to sort of control and coerce us. Um, and, and Zelensky's message is that Ukraine is not going to try to trade any of the kind of comforts um, uh, and and survival if it means becoming slaves. And for those who watch this channel, many will, um, they will also see channels, an incredible channel um, on YouTube called 1420, uh, where Russians are interviewed on the streets about their attitudes. And for people who've, who've lived in Russia itself, um, whether it's likely to have been in a town, some may have uh, you know visited villages as well, um, you would have seen the pervasive attitude in Russia that, and, and in the 1420 channel as well, that many people would trade their freedom for a little bit of comfort. They would trade their freedom to be left in peace, to have food in their fridges and just sort of live not even a lavish material life, but just, just a, a basic material uh, life. Um, Freedom is 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 low down, I think, on the list of priorities uh, of of most Russians, actually. Um, and that's in stark contrast to Ukrainians, where it's possibly uh, right at the top of the list. Um, many Russians also get the impression, uh, you know, would rather trade their freedom than be forced to 
think too much or examine the past too much. Uh, you know, that, of course, could be because the past is too painful because it's too complex because you can't do anything about it to change, you know, the horror of the past. But I think what that means is that by not addressing it, it means that those horrors are, are now being repeated in the present as well. And it seems also that Russians do not have the same capacity to resist oppression, not just the sort of mechanics and politics of it, but the 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 instinct to uh, to resist oppression um, and not want to be told what to do. In fact, quite the reverse. I get the impression that many Russians rather like being told what to do. Again, it comes back to, you know, this idea of don't don't make me think too hard. And I don't know what you think here about this idea of, you know, bargaining uh, with your oppressor for some kind of short term or material gain. Um, does that strike you as a, a particularly Russian thing uh, or, or are Ukrainians susceptible to it as well? Uh, exactly. I also uh, watch the interviews of uh, Russians uh, in, in the streets of Russian uh, Russia's uh, towns and cities, and uh, listening what they are uh, speaking, what they are talking, how they are answering uh, questions. Uh, my general sensation is uh, that they are uh, supporting uh, this war. Uh, the majority of them. So and uh, also. Uh, we should be very cautious uh, of this, uh, you know, uh, very mean uh, concept of Putin's war, uh, because it's not Putin's war. And uh, if we are asking Ukrainian uh, soldiers, Ukrainian uh, women, civilians, they say uh, it's not uh, Putin who is shooting at me. It's not Putin who is trying to kill me or to rape me or, or what's, uh, whatsoever. Uh, it's uh, they ha uh, Putin won't do this uh, if uh, he uh, so uh, he is doing that because uh, he has a support of the majority uh, of uh, Russians and this you know uh, trading uh, that's something that we cannot uh, understand uh, as uh, Ukrainians because uh, you know we do not uh, understand overall what is the aim of this war. Uh, each war, each war should have uh, uh, should has uh, should have sorry uh, an aim. So, what is the aim um, of the presence of uh, Russian troops on the Ukrainian territory? It, it, it was something I could not understand um, in the beginning of this war. In fact, so what? Uh, we want uh, to trade uh, the territories, we want to have at least something, we could not capture cave, okay, uh, let's have less and less and less, uh, but uh, Ukraine, it's a sovereign, uh, independent country, and we are not going uh, to trade uh, our territories or to negotiate uh, with uh, other uh, country, uh, it's, it's nonsense. Uh, it's uh, it does not work like that and if we will show this uh, precedent uh, to uh, uh, other world uh, to other countries uh, i'm more than sure that some of them will do the same with their neighbors yes absolutely that's absolutely right i mean i'm not sure there is an aim on russia's side now or in putin's mind it's just for him a question now of survival his personal survival and survival is regime and his ability to uh, protect the treasure that he's stolen. But let's go back to literature, because I know I'm very ignorant of Ukrainian literature, I have to admit it. Uh, I've not read much in translation either. I know a lot more is becoming available now. Uh, now it's a question of finding the time, uh, and I, but I would love to get to grips with it. Um, but I have read an awful lot of Russian literature, both in translation and in the original. And I'm really interested in understanding what are the differences in tone, structure, narrative and style between Ukrainian literature and Russian literature. Oh, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated question. <laughs> um, Ukrainian literature is uh, more ancient than uh, Russian. Uh, we have our uh, medieval uh, narrative, which is um, uh, the tale uh, of uh, Igor's campaign. 
uh, which is uh, the which belongs to the 12th uh, century and uh, Russia they are having their own uh, narrative uh, which uh, emerged uh, two centuries later uh, what they are doing uh, they are uh, just uh, trying to say and this narrative was very popular after world war ii uh, in uh, western academia uh, as well uh, it was uh, this uh, our uh, text uh, was called a fake it, that it was not real it was uh, uh, written later by uh, an unknown author and it's not authentic it's not ukrainian uh, although this uh, text is uh, describing uh, the uh, territories and uh, events of uh, kiev and rus uh, so these uh, territories actually now are belong uh, to uh, ukraine and uh, the same uh, i could say that uh, ukrainian uh, baroque literature uh, was uh, very well developed while uh, in Russia uh, we can see the flourish of their literature uh, in uh, the um, I would say during the period of uh, uh, enlightenment uh, with uh, the uh, um, when the empire came to might and uh, the emergence and the mighty of this new state uh, should be described uh, in uh, poetry, in literature, and so on and so forth. And that what uh, uh, Russian writers were doing. They were uh, writing odes uh, to uh, czars, to emperors, uh, to uh, knights, uh, to uh, different uh, people of uh, Russian aristocratic origin. But uh, when you look uh, at uh, Ukrainian literature of that time, uh, and especially uh, even Shevchenko's voice, it was uh, very, very critical uh, to uh, the Russian uh, empires. And uh, in this sense, Shevchenko uh, challenged uh, the foundations uh, of Russian empire. Uh, he shatters them and did not fear to do that. And uh, also, uh, when the uh, Cossack Hetman state was cancelled by Catherine II, uh, we could see uh, how uh, Ukrainian uh, literature and culture uh, did not vanish, but uh, it was uh, represented in terms of folk tradition and in terms of uh, uh, vagabond poet, uh, poets uh, of the Baroque uh, era. So it was transmitted in um, oral uh, tradition. And it was uh, uh, like that during uh, the uh, hard, uh, turbulent times for Ukrainian literature and culture. Uh, and this, it, it's partly is the reason why it managed uh, to survive because of folklore, because of uh, oral tradition. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, and uh, if we are looking at uh, the 20th uh, uh, century, 19th, uh, we, we talked a little about it, uh, 20th century, uh, it's uh, probably the most uh, tragic page uh, in the history of Ukrainian literature, uh, given uh, the Stalin's great terror of uh, 1937, and uh, then the establishment of the socialist realism as uh, the main uh, method that was, uh, in fact, uh, meant as a state uh, control uh, over the all uh, literary production uh, and uh, um, so uh, for me here uh, the uh, Alexander Dovzhenko's or Alexander Dovzhenko's uh, case is also topical because uh, uh, Alexander Dovzhenko he was uh, in uh, Petlura's uh, uh, army, uh, Ukrainian nationalist army, but uh, somehow he managed to survive. Uh, and uh, by the end of his life, uh, Stalin uh, kept this artist uh, close uh, to him. Uh, he was lived uh, near uh, Moscow and Stalin himself uh, edited his uh, script, script uh, his text. It was uh, 
Uh, it is known now uh, due to the archival dot data, uh, which is uh, available uh, now for us. And we also see uh, see uh, this uh, repressive uh, machine against uh, Ukrainian uh, artists. Uh, and uh, especially those who were uh, writing scripts uh, for cinema, as the cinema was uh, considered an art for a uh, broad uh, population, for people, and clearly it should uh, have uh, very distinct uh, ideological uh, messages. Yes, and also we can uh, think uh, about uh, Ukrainian uh, dissidents, uh, many of uh, whom were uh, killed, uh, uh, executed uh, in a car crash uh, by chance. Uh, so uh, it's uh, obvious that uh, no one did not explore uh, these cases. Uh, for example, how a Ukrainian uh, poet uh, Vasil Stus uh, was uh, was killed uh, in a prison camp uh, um, uh, in Russia, but uh, they uh, said that it was uh, accidentally, but evidence uh, tell uh, the different uh, story. Uh, so it was, yes, uh, but even uh, living in such uh, hard uh, conditions, uh, Ukrainian uh, writers uh, and poets did much for preserving their uh, Ukrainian uh, identity. And even the fact that they managed to write uh, in uh, Ukrainian is also uh, very telling. And how important has the survival of the Ukrainian language been in order to keep that literary tradition alive? If you compare Ukraine to, say, Belarus, where the language has been sort of eroded, almost disappeared, you see a weakening uh, of their literary traditions at the same time as an erosion uh, of their sort of political institutions and, and freedoms. And uh, thank you for this question, because I would like to add uh, briefly, uh, I, I did not uh, tell uh, our audience that before, but it also worth mentioning that in the uh, 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, uh, it was uh, there were two um, uh, official state documents uh, that uh, restricted uh, the use of Ukrainian language uh, in public spheres and in book publishing. I mean here the uh, Valuyev uh, Sokular of uh, 1863. So uh, if we are thinking it's uh, in um, uh, it's uh, 20 years, uh, 23 years later, uh, um, when Kobzar by Shevchenko was uh, published. And this uh, uh, circular, uh, it uh, uh, forbade uh, Ukrainian la language uh, uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, done on the level of the state politics uh, when uh, Valuyev, the minister, said that a separate little Russian language never existed, does not exist and shall not uh, exist. And uh, the other is Ems Ukaz, it's very similar, uh, of uh, 1876. It also uh, banned uh, use of Ukrainian language in print, uh, except uh, the old uh, documents. And the, uh, this uh, document also forbade, uh, of Ukra uh, forbade Ukrainian uh, publications and the staging of plays or lectures in Ukrainian. Uh, and it's also very important because uh, somehow the uh, Russian regime uh, saw uh, the threat uh, in um, Ukrainian culture, language uh, and literature, which transmitted uh, some ideas that did not fit uh, into the uh, policy of uh, in Russian uh, empire. And uh, uh, the language, um, uh, Ukrainian language uh, was... Uh, Russian propaganda told uh, the Soviet uh, citizens that uh, we are brothers, we are sisters, and uh, mm, there is no difference uh, which language are you using, Russian, Ukrainian, um, we will understand each other. But the fact is uh, that uh, 
uh, Ukrainians uh, know Ukrainian language and uh, Russian language and understand Russian language. And the Russians, when we are uh, speaking with them in uh, uh, Ukrainian, for example, they uh, the majority of them uh, won't uh, understand and won't pronounce uh, Ukrainian words in the right manner. And it was a very, um, I would say, uh, wise uh, politics. So they told uh, to their to the Soviet citizen citizens uh, one thing, but in fact they did another, uh, because in the official sphere. Uh, Russian language was uh, cultivated and was spread, oppressing other uh, national languages uh, that were uh, also very vivid in Ukraine. It's not only Ukrainian, uh, but uh, Georgian, uh, Jewish, uh, Armenian, uh, Romanian, uh, Crimean, Tatar, uh, and so on and so forth. They just uh, erased uh, these uh, groups. Uh, from the so-called uh, Russian uh, space, Soviet space, that had to be uh, homogeneous, uh, not to, to threaten uh, Russian law. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, Ukrainian language was uh, regarded as not uh, prestigious, uh, as, as something that is uh, not necessary. Uh, and uh, this overall, this attitude we can uh, find uh, even uh, now uh, among the um, Ukrainians, because if it is culture, it was associated with Russian culture. Uh, uh, which called itself a uh, great Russian culture in such a way uh, oppressing other uh, literatures and cultures that existed in the Soviet Union. So folklore would have perhaps been tolerated, that genre tolerated in Ukrainian literature uh, within the Soviet period, and maybe sort of things like ghost stories as well. Um, they would have been seen as lesser literary traditions than the sort of canonical ones, but also would have perhaps not been seen as a political uh, threat and of course you know even for more serious ukrainian writers i'm guessing in russia they would not have been seen as part of that great canon of literature of great great sort of writers uh you know whether it be 19th century or or uh, or of the soviet period they would not have been seen as high literature um and they would have perhaps not had the kind of themes that uh, you know would have been familiar to Russian audiences, or which they would necessarily have been looking for uh, in in their uh, in their reading material. Uh, yes, it was also uh, a part of uh, uh, empire uh, to associate uh, Ukrainian uh, culture and uh, language with peasantry, for example. Yeah or with uh, some folklore, uh, or with uh, some oral tradition, uh, and ma making it not serious, not something not very much important. And we can see this on the example how uh, the Soviet uh, propaganda uh, made uh, Shevchenko as, you know, a poet, a peasant poet, and uh, a poet for peasantry and so and so on and so forth but in fact uh, Shevchenko belongs uh, to intelligentsia uh, he graduated from the St Petersburg Academy of Arts which was very prestigious uh, uh, educational center in not only in Russia but in Europe it was widely recognized and he uh, communicated to uh, different uh, intellectuals and uh, was uh, thinking about the intellectuals ideas of his uh, uh, time and uh, by the way uh, the question of uh, serfdom was in the center of the discussion and we know the position of Shevchenko to, to this uh, question uh, who, uh, who was uh, of course against it and uh, yes uh, we can see how uh, well uh, Shevchenko uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, other 
Uh, so what propaganda did with the image of Shevchenko, it uh, said that it not as serious, as influential as uh, he really uh, was. And it was also the means of this, but uh, you know, and uh, for example, uh, when we see uh, monuments uh, to uh, Alexander Pushkin uh, all over Ukraine, even in uh, the cities, in the towns that Pushkin uh, did not know that they uh, exist <laughs> on the map. Yeah, definitely. And many of those monuments are now being replaced, I think, you know, by more appropriate uh, local heroes and icons. Well, my last question uh, sort of has more of a, a forward looking uh, aspect to it. And of course, the current period that's being lived through is extraordinarily turbulent. A lot of Ukrainian writers, historians, poets, musicians are fighting on the front lines. Some of them will will not make it back. In fact, many leading cultural figures have have already very sadly sort of died either in the hostilities um, or, or, or on the home front as well. And the experiences that people are getting by fighting uh, and obviously, when Ukraine is victorious and you have the diaspora returning home as well with their experiences of living abroad as refugees, there's going to be this extraordinary set of influences and potential dynamism and energy. Where do you think Ukrainian literature is going, you know, in, in the next couple of years with all these extraordinary events, pressures and traumas, uh, but also you know, dramatic experiences influencing it? Yes, as you said, on the one on the one hand, we have uh, many Ukrainian uh, refugees. Uh, I think it was uh, six million or seven million, something like that. Yeah, all over the world uh, that uh, are telling the world uh, all about uh, Ukrainian uh, literature, history, culture, and uh, have a chance to cultivate their own culture there. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, what we are having uh, in Ukraine now, uh, because uh, of Russia's full-scale invasion, is uh, that uh, they are destroying uh, not only uh, people, uh, as you said, uh, poets, painters, uh, composers, uh, writers, uh, but also um, museums, uh, churches, uh, schools, uh, universities, uh, educational centers, archives. Uh, and, uh, you know, it means that uh, Ukrainian culture is now uh, under survival because uh, on the map of Ukraine, uh, there are now uh, the cities uh, that are being uh, totally destroyed, totally ruined, uh, that are no, do not uh, exist anymore. We won't see them. And uh, it's, of course, it's a part of our culture and uh, our heritage. And we are now surviving uh, as, uh, uh, and our aim is uh, to preserve uh, as much uh, as we can. Uh, as for uh, predictions about Ukrainian literature, um, it's, it's complicated, but uh, what we see now that um, uh, I've been thinking about this uh, lately, that uh, uh, in Ukraine, uh, poet or writer uh, could not just be a uh, poet or writer. Uh, it is always something more. And uh, given the fact how many Ukrainian uh, writers, poets, uh, uh, teachers, uh, professors, journalists, uh, etc., are in the front lines, uh, we clearly um, understand them, understand that, that uh, they are, uh, it's not time for writing, it's time to fight and uh, to uh, defend uh, Ukraine, because uh, uh, if we won't have Ukraine for, for whom they are going to, to write. And it's, it's very uh, clear for us now, uh, but uh, I think that if we manage to, to uh, survive, and we don't have any doubt in that in that uh, this uh, experience uh, would uh, could give us uh, um, uh, a more uh, deep sensation of for of ourselves and uh, i think we will have also new topics uh, in our literature and uh, i think we also will uh, reconsider uh, our uh, tradition and uh, those writers and poets uh, who lived uh, before us well that's been absolutely fascinating Ocha. 
And, you know, I, I think almost everybody in the UK wishes for your Ukrainian victory. I know that it's not exactly the same in every country, and Russian propaganda does percolate into some countries more than others. Um, but I'm certainly sure that Ukraine will be victorious. And I think you've helped us to understand several of the reasons why that will be the case. The strength of culture, the strength of influences and literature, and this sense throughout Ukraine's history, as you say, of resisting oppression. But thank you so much for joining us on the channel. Thank you, Jonathan.